up? Welcome back. I'll talk if you'll listen. Episode 67, 67. And it's your friendly neighborhood, Tim. And um, not much to talk about this this week, but trying to stay true about what I mentioned last week and getting back into a habit. But there was something that was really heavy on my mind that I saw on social media that I really wanted to run by all of you regarding fatherhood and in particular black fatherhood. So I'll be getting into that in just a bit, but let's start with a few things. So made a little bit of progress on my certification and I realized that I didn't really go in depth last week on what an APTD certification is. So I'm just going to expand on that a little bit and then kind of give you a small update. So what an APTD certification is, again, like I mentioned last week, it stands for Associate Professional Associate Professional Talent Development Certification. And it basically helps you get, it validates your knowledge and experience when it comes to adult learning. And that's regardless of the environment. And it's basically you teaching adults in professional environments or how to become better professionals or to grasp certain competencies in their area of work or field of work. And the thing that makes this certification so cool, so valuable, and so diverse is it tackles so many different competencies. They have three main competencies. They have, uh, let's see if I can do this off of memory, see if I've been studying. They have um, an organizational development competency, they have a personal development competency, and they have a professional development competency. And I'm still learning about a lot of these, but basically it touches on things like how adults learn, uh, how to shake things up, how to facilitate courses, how to teach virtually, how to teach in person, how to develop courses so people can learn at different paces. It talks about why adults need to learn the way that they do, emotional intelligence, building uh, on uh, different organizational developmental opportunities. So as I get a little bit more in-depth into what I'm learning, I'll be able to explain a lot of this much more, like much easier in, in a way, a more simpler way. Just so if anyone's curious and either they want to get into it themselves or just so they can follow along because I'm going to try to make this very present. Like I mentioned last week, it helps with an accountability level. If you all know that I'm studying and I'm talking about this every week, it kind of helps you all hold me accountable. And then from a studying standpoint, it helps me remember because I'm constantly talking about it. And although some of the things I can apply at work almost right away other things while I'm learning, it'll be easier, especially if I don't have many people to talk to this about. There aren't too many in my too many people in my life that are passionate about training, and the ones that are uh, just aren't really readily accessible to me because they have their own lives, own goals, um, other responsibilities that are occupying their day to day. With that, one thing that I learned recently is. I read two articles um, that was really helpful uh, in the area of teaching and learning. So one is how adults learn, how they pull from previous experiences. I've always really incorporated that into my training, but it's now a more focused approach. I guess I do it a little bit more intentionally now than I used to. But basically, I try to put the adults that I'm teaching, so in this case, my coworkers, in a position that held, helped them recall a recent experience. Hey, tell me about a time where you had to take your kid to school, or I want you to recall a time that you had to schedule an appointment at a doctor's office. And what I try to do is find a lesson in that and pull from that and apply it to what we're currently working on, a task at hand. Another thing adults like to do is they'd like to see basically how the information you're giving them, how can it help them now? How can it help to resolve an issue or a problem? So basically, if they're in training and they're a new hire, 
it's going to be something along the lines of, well, I'm a new hire. How is this training helping me do my job or get to know my job or get to do my job faster and better, uh, more efficient? If it's someone who's going through ongoing training, basically someone who's been here for two, three, five, 10, 15 years, uh, of course, everyone can learn. Training should never stop. But you know, like I know, you have people who feel like they know it all. You have people who feel like they arrived. I've been here 20 years, so there's nothing else that you can teach me. There's nothing else that I can learn from. So for those types, you need to basically present them with some information that's relevant. So for if, if it's like a new a new system, exam, as an example, you're introducing a new system, it could be something along the lines of, here's why you need to know this. This helps you do your job better. It normally takes you 10 minutes to do task A. This job, will, this new feature or function or system well, shave three minutes off of that, and it'll now be seven minutes to do this thing. So I'm learning a little, a little bit about that. I've also read an article. The other article that I read was the one pertaining to virtual learning. And it's so funny how relevant training can be and how timeless it can be, because this article was written back in like 2014, and here we are seven years later, and it's very relevant regarding virtual training and virtual learning. And what it talked about specifically was to get people involved. And again, something else that I did, but it was just happenstance or something that I felt like it was effective. Now this article helped to reinforce what I already know, and it validated what I have already been doing. So now I do it with a more in, intent um, or a more focused approach. Um where I get the people on the training involved, where I have them take over, I have them present, I have them explain it back and doing a little activity. So I actually developed some training courses at work that I put together that were really cool. And they were really simple things like match this scenario with this scenario or put this scenario in this box over here. But I'm really proud of myself just to toot my own horn a little bit and getting into this because like I mentioned last week I knew my confidence level when it came to training and I knew how impactful I could be as a trainer doesn't mean I I know I haven't arrived I know there's so much more I can learn ergo this certification but reading these articles that reinforce the things that I already do it's really helping to be, helping me to build confidence and really helping me to be more comfortable because it's kind of like that thing where you go to the gym and you lift on your own and through your own studying and experience, you learn how to lift or you learn how to eat, you know, as far as nutrition is concerned, you know how to work out. And then you say, you know what, let me stop playing around and let me get a trainer or let me get a nutritionist or let me get a personal trainer or something along those lines. and they kind of start to tell you things that you've already been doing. Now, the difficult part, the challenging part, is not letting that go to your head, right? For me, in my scenario, reading these articles and reading these lessons and courses, and I'm going, oh, I already do that. Well, you know, I'm the sugar honey iced tea. I don't need to study. I'm good to go. No, it's it's always good to kind of like come off that high horse, or better yet, not even get on it, and try to just humble yourself and go in, Hey, I didn't know that I knew this. Now I do. Now I do. Great. Move on to the next topic. And even better, maybe I can teach this to somebody else. But it's really, really difficult in any area, even like fighting games. You know, you could probably be the best in your neighborhood and you go online and you start trashing people online almost immediately before you get to your first loss. You're going to feel like, oh, I'm I arrived. I'm good. I can't get better. And you never want to get comfortable. You never want to get content. Um, and hopefully this can help to wake up some dragons inside of me and I can start, you know, getting that motivational flame going, so to speak. And honestly, y'all, I know I said it last week and I know this is going to sound really, really corny, but just know that this is genuine. The biggest reason that I'm so excited to learn all of this stuff is just so I could teach other people. And I think it, it takes a certain type of person to look at it and go, Hey, I paid money for this knowledge. Now you got to pay money to get it too, or at least pay me. And I think that'll come, but knowledge is meant to be shared. So if I can get this information and share it, hey, 
the pieces will fall where they may, and it'll get to the point where people are recommending me, and maybe I do start selling my services, and I do start consulting certain things um, as an amateur and then eventually as a professional. But ultimately, training is just so important to me. Like, I'm obsessed with training. I love teaching. I love learning. And I can't wait to expand on this and and hopefully touch more people uh, through this certification. So um, I'm really excited. I'm going to share a little bit more throughout the week. Hopefully, you follow me on social media, so keep an eye out for that. If you don't, then, of course, tune into this podcast regularly to hear updates regarding my journey. Now, I found that, so I ordered something really, really cool. I'm not going to say what it is because I ordered uh, this for myself and I ordered it for my lady. Our anniversary is coming up. So um, I got us something together that will really help us together when it comes to like studying and such. And I can't wait to get it. I found that I'm more likely to study right before bed uh, or when I'm out walking or like I mentioned last week, when I am doing tax, tasks around the house, when I'm cleaning up and, and stuff around the house. So I, I'm starting to see a, some semblance of a routine forming. And I know it could take upwards to like 21 days for a routine to stick. But I'm excited. I'm not going to give up. I know I'm going to have so low, some low moments. I'm no, I know I'm going to have some moments where I'm not motivated and I'm discouraged. But I just need everybody's help to help me, help myself, and just fight through that. Just barrel through that. And I'm sure I could do it. Trying to pursue stuff like this. When See, here's the challenge. It's like a lose-lose situation. You could go straight to college or pursue certifications right out of high school while you're young. And you're eager, you're motivated, and your brain is still a sponge, and you're still in learning mode because you just came off of 13 plus years, if you include kindergarten, of like learning. And your brain and body, it you're already used to that, right? But when you take a break because you work full time right out of high school, like I did, I was working full time in 11th grade and it transitioned to I just never went to college, Um, which I never told that story to you all. Maybe I'll tell that story for you all one day, but I never went to college and I went straight to, you know, continue my job and I was fine. I was making more money than a lot of my peers because they were all in school. But going back to the lose-lose situation, it's like, yeah, you could go right out of high school, but you're taking out all these loans if you don't get scholarships and grants. And you're, now you're in debt, and now you got to pay that off, and you don't even know if you'll be working in your field of study. So there's so many people that I knew when I was working full time, and this was before I was even a manager. I was an assistant manager, making more than my peers because, and this is not to knock their journey at all, but this is just to add validity to what I'm saying. They were working at Rite Aid or Walgreens, or they were working you know, somewhere else. In some cases, they were working at the very same store that I was working at. And again, not to knock their journey, but they just amassed all of this debt to be in the same spot that I'm in now. And I don't have the debt. So on one end, it's like, okay, great. Well, maybe I shouldn't say lose-lose. I should say win-lose. Because you win on the financial side of it short term because you're not in debt. And yeah, you're maybe not making as much money as you could be, You also don't have to worry about that debt and you don't have to allocate money or garnish wages towards that. The downside, the lose side of things is you come out of that routine, you come out of that habit. And now here I am at 31 years old trying to get this certification. I definitely don't want to make this out to be much bigger than it really is. It's not like I'm going after a doctorate or something, but my point still remains that I'm putting myself back into a learning mode and putting myself back into a schedule That's not fixed. It's not like the class will get dropped or I'm in high school and there's some legal ramifications for my parents if I'm just not going. There is nobody suffers other than me. I mean, the Association for Talent Development, they got their money already. I already paid them. And then I got to pay them again to take the exam. They already got their money. So if I let my subscription expire and I just don't take the exam, whatever, they just earned a free $300, free $300. They're they're happier for it. So 
there's a challenge here at 31, and even if I was 28 or if I was 46, doesn't matter when you take that long of a break from learning, your brain and your body falls out of that routine. But you do have a little bit more money now to be a little bit more financially stable and not have to worry about necessarily getting as many as much financial assistance as maybe you would have needed at 18. Now, everybody's story is different. So before y'all jump down my throat saying, well, hey, what if I have two kids or what if I have this, what I have that? In general, you should be if everything, if you've gotten better year over year since 18, you should be in a better financial position. Because even if you were working at a grocery store at 18, if you're busting your butt and giving 110% at that grocery store and you're still there at 31, you're still there at 46, theoretically speaking, you should be making more money than you would have been making at 18 because maybe you're running the place or maybe you're in leadership now, whether it be management, front-end management, assistant manager, whatever, um, and there should be more options for you. You've also amassed more knowledge and experience in how to get free money, like educational grants and other supports and nonprofit organization um, assistance, things of that nature. So again, a win-lose I think Charles and I talked about it on an episode not too long ago when it came to when you should go to college and what is more important timing wise. And everybody's journey is different. But again, there are some I think you'd be pretty naive to say that there are no pros to going to college later in life or there are no cons to going to college earlier in life. There there are definitely pros and cons on both sides of the fence. Now, I'm going to talk about something that I spoke about earlier in the week on social media, if you follow me on Instagram, and I can't wait to dive into this topic with you all. It's pretty deep. I'm going to get into it right after this. Hey, y'all. Welcome back. Had to pay some bills. Now, earlier this week, I'm on social media, and social media gets a lot of bad rap. I think, it could, just like anything, it could be really negative and counterproductive, and very poisonous, figuratively speaking, but there are also plus sides to it. It can expose you to new things. It can keep you connected to people you wouldn't have otherwise been connected to. And it could definitely bring some interesting topics across your feed. Now, Twitter, in my opinion, is extremely toxic. Honestly, if it wasn't for the show, I would not have a Twitter. I initially got into it for sports, and I'm really glad I did. And I love being around it during sports season. For the sports that I'm uh, following anyway. But in general, in my experience, Twitter is extremely toxic. I got to find a way to spruce up my algorithm a little bit to get rid of all of the toxicity. But Instagram is a mixed bag. And I came across something on my Instagram feed that I thought was really interesting. So I follow a few podcast networks or a few podcast pages that promote other podcast networks. And it's bumming me out. I completely forgot to look up what podcast this was. I told myself I would look it up before recording this, and I completely forgot. But there was a video uh, that came that I came across from a podcast that was recorded where it was a young man, a young woman, and a young woman, young black woman, at, and the young man was black as well, asked, what do fathers bring to a child's life other than money? Or other than financial stability. And I couldn't, I don't think I'm going to do a good job of describing the emotion that I felt instantly when I heard the question. But I'm going to try. I was angry. I was frustrated. I was defensive. I got defensive. And I got really, in my mind, I took a really condescending tone. Like all of the things that I resent about women and let's be honest we all resent something about the the opposite sex especially when it comes to the way we were raised so a lot of my resentment is stewed in like three major women in my life one being my mother uh one being the young lady I went on prom with and the other being a young lady that uh, my first major relationship so there's a lot of resentment buried in my soul due to those three women, and all of those 
resentful feelings and negative feelings started to come out in that moment. And I can't tell you how much that resentment was being fed. It was it was like, see, that's what I'm talking about. That's their problem now. It, you know, it, it went straight to that. But then as I listened to the discussion and I listened to the guy answer, I started to feel a little bit more sorrow. I started to feel a little bit more disappointment. And all of my reactive and violent feelings went away. And I started to listen. And the more I started to observe, I realized that the young lady genuinely didn't know. And that's what made me sad. Now, who knows why she didn't know? She could have been raised by a, a single parent um, where if she was with her father, that's all he did was provide money. Hey, here's money. Go out with your friends. Here's money for the latest technology. But when she was with her mother, if her mother was around, um, that's when the nurture, the emotion, the time spent, uh, gifts, all that stuff was there. Or uh, if she was with her mother, and the father was only around, like, dropping off money and then leaving and wasn't really spending too much time. Or if that's just her perception based on the men and the women in her life or what she sees on TV or what people have told her. Um, who knows what led her to that ignorance. But I just was so sad and disappointed. And I posted it because I thought it was crazy. And my, my good friend of mine, Reese, uh, Maurice, uh, he was on the show uh, a few times, so if you if you're a regular listener of the show, listener of the show, uh, you should be pretty familiar with my buddy Reese. I uh, sent it over to him because Reese is a single father, to my knowledge. I don't know if he's in a relationship right now, but he he's very recently been a single father, and uh, Reese and I share a lot of the same goals and core values and philosophies. So I sent that over to him because. I just wanted somebody to basically bask in my pain, you know, oh my goodness, you know, it's kind of like that friend you want to gossip with a little bit. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, Reese, look at this. And then I texted him and we decided to get on and do an IG live. It is still up on my Instagram. If you want to go check it out, I'm leaving that up indefinitely. I am going to edit it and put it up on my YouTube page for all of my YouTube subscribers uh, so you can listen to it. But I do encourage you to follow me on Instagram. It's at T-I-M, so Tim, underscore, and then it's the show's initials, I-T-I-Y-L. So at Tim, underscore, I-T-I-Y-L. And um, go look at my IGTV feed, and you'll see it on there, me and Reese. Uh, It's probably about 50 minutes or so, if you want to catch it. We did have some interaction It's not like we had hundreds or thousands or even dozens of views, uh, but we did have in the moment a lot of people, a fair amount of people uh, participating and commenting, and I'll do those every now and again. I wish I could have some structure, but the way my schedule is set up, they're usually spontaneous, but that's even more incentive why you want to follow me so you can see all of it. And for the most part, I usually leave that stuff up on the page unedited. Just so if you can't watch live, you can watch later. But Reese and I had a, like a freestyle discussion. This was before I could really digest my thoughts, before Reese could really digest his thoughts. And we kind of sat down. I think we saw that video at like 10 in the morning or 11 in the morning. I And I hit him up like around 4, like, yo, you want to go live around 7? And he said, yeah. So we went live around 7 um, or 7.15 after some technical difficulties. But... We went live and we discussed it, and I'm not going to take away from the video, so go watch it, but Reese brought up some really good points. I love, love, love talking with Reese. He just brings so much perspective and so much value to to any discussion that he's a part of. I'm so glad to have him in my life, and I will give you some of my takeaways. The first thing, like I said, I was really emotional, but as I dissected everything, It kind of got my mind to wonder, and I'm not going to, I think statistics doesn't really do this discussion justice, because I think this is an emotional, anecdotal discussion, where it's about how you feel and what your perception is. One thing I will say that Reset is, our society is based on stereotypes and stigmas, and I'll expand on that a little bit here. A lot 
of what this discussion has is emotion and the way we feel is because of our perception of stereotypes and of stigmas that fall onto parents in, in general, and rather I should say specifically fathers. And I thought about, my mind started to wonder, or rather my mind started to wander, that off into this like place where I'm thinking to myself, what led her here? And there's so many scenarios, right? She could have been in, a, so I, I talked about this a little bit before, and I know I'm all over the place, y'all, but I am so thankful for my father that he wanted me in his life and he wanted to be in my life so bad that he took my mother to court. And in the moment, I didn't realize it, but looking back on it, my mother was hell-bent on keeping me away from my dad. She even asked me to lie to the judge. She even asked me to, you know, uh, stretch some stories or say, like, I don't feel safe around him, things like that. And I didn't because I felt weird doing that. But it just it just made me think that from the outside looking in, again, here's a stereotype, here's a stigma. From the outside looking in, my father wasn't around because of him. My father wasn't around because he was locked up or he did something grimy or he, he was the one that made the poor decision. That's why I was with my mom. That's why she had full custody. But that what couldn't have been further from the truth. From the truth, uh, with one small exception, my father was incarcerated, inc- incarcerated when I was born. But when he get out, when he got out, he took a paternity test um, to prove that I was his son, and he went through hell and high water to make sure that he was involved. And that just kind of makes me think, be so thankful for him that he had the courage to do that, because I know how the judicial system. And I know how bitter moms can really suck the life out of fathers who want to be around. But here's another thing. It's such a stigma that the mother is the, like the the mother's the victim. And I don't, I I want to take, I'm being brutally honest here, y'all. No filter. Everybody's story is different. There are times when the mother's the victim. There are times when the father is the victim. But ultimately, consistently, you never want to have the child be the victim. And I can admit all of this now as an adult looking back. It's just in a moment, typically speaking, it's typical to side with my mom, right? But like as you kind of open up the book and you look at some things, some things I'm not going to talk about, but you realize that like my mom was really bitter and she was trying to hurt my father by keeping me away from him. And what she didn't realize is how much damage that would have done to me. And it was very selfish of her to do that. Now, I know this might be a sensitive or touchy topic for some people, especially if you're a single mother listening to this, because you're probably identifying with a lot of what I'm saying. But don't get lost in the sauce. My point remains that stereotypes and stigmas are here. And sometimes you look at someone's situation and you just make assumptions based on stereotypes and stigmas. Uh, there could be a very happy child, a very healthy child whose parents just weren't compatible and they recognized that they were mature enough to recognize that and split up, but they have two loving environments. The parents are very cordial, respectful, in some cases, even joke and laugh. They can have each other's families around a child and, um, around social events and family events and everything's fine. But Society will tell you that it was a bitter breakup and one of the parents is keeping the parent, the other parent from the child. And we really need to take a step back and kind of look at these perceptions and we really need to ask ourselves, like, why do we assume that when the mom and the dad aren't together, the father only gets to see the child every other week? Or on certain holidays. Why do we assume that the mother got custody because she deserved it? Why do we assume that? And there's a lot that I think we need to take a look at. I think this is going to rub a lot of people the wrong way. Because I think they don't want to ask those questions. They don't want to look at their those parents. Um, or I'm sorry, their parents in a certain light. Especially if their parents split up. 
and especially if they feel responsible for that. And more specifically, if they are kind of on their father's side or kind of on their mother's side, I know this is going to rub them the wrong way if they're even still listening to the podcast. But we really need to challenge our belief system and we really need to challenge why we feel the way that we do when we take a look at certain parental situations. When I think about this young lady and her question, it just makes me think she probably didn't have a positive male role model in her life. The two most likely scenarios, in my opinion, are either she had a father in her life, but that's all he did, or she didn't have a father in her life, or there's another possibility that a bitter person, whether it be a bitter man who couldn't be with her mom, or whether it be her mother who's bitter, or whether it be a friend or peer who's bitter, who just pumped into her head and said, this this is all men is are good for. This is, this is the only thing that they bring to the table is just money. And it's, it's just, again, it's just really concerning, really sad. And I encourage you all to go look at that video. It was really, really, really... Um, introspective, very philosophical, and I think it asked some tough questions. It really put some attention on some areas that maybe we shy away from. We go through this life like thinking like how things are supposed to be, and when they don't fit that description, they don't fit that area, we sit back and go like, well, this is wrong, or this person is living their life wrong or leading their life wrong. But sometimes there's no right or wrong, it's just different. And if we can apply that to food, if we can apply that to school and education, if we can apply that even to where we want to live, why can't we apply that to parenting? It's so crazy that, like, there are certain things that are not equal when it comes to parenting. Not because they really aren't equal, but because we, we're the problem. We make them not equal. If a father is going above and beyond and giving 110% and being a father, we just say, oh, that's what he's supposed to do. You know, um, if a father's being nurtured, nurturing, more, a little bit more sensitive, we sit here and call him out. We call him a punk or we call him a wimp. And I, obviously these are PG words, but I'm sure you all can imagine the, the more explicit versions of that. That's what we label him. Um, and there are hardworking parents out there that I think should be praised for for doing it. And I know some people are like, oh, well, hey, that's what you're supposed to do. But that's the problem. You don't, I don't think we, we don't do a good job of applauding good parenting unless we see an abnormal success story. Relatively speaking, there are not that many athletes in an NFL compared to people who never made it in the NFL. Just because you never made it in the NFL doesn't mean you didn't have good parents. Just because you um, didn't win or compete in the Olympics doesn't mean you didn't have good parents. Just because you didn't win the PGA Tour doesn't mean you didn't have good parents. And I know I can use other examples outside of sports. I take education. Just because you didn't graduate magnum cum laude or summa cum laude, you know, laude, laude, it's laude, I'm pretty sure it's laude, uh, doesn't mean you didn't have good parents. Just because you went to public school, maybe you went to community college and you have a really good job does not mean you didn't have good parents. And I think we need to do a better job of giving people their roses while they can still smell them. If you got a roof over your head, and you have a relatively healthy life, you have a relatively healthy healthy family, your parents did good enough. Um, especially for the people who are oldest or the only child. Your parent was never a parent before you. And I know a lot of older or middle children are thinking to themselves, my parents, like my younger brother, my younger sister, they had way different parents than I did. And in a way, that's true. But like parenting, just like all things, comes with like growth and time and learning. 
So let's cut our parents some slack. But let's also hold them accountable. You know, um, I held my mom accountable. I spoke to certain aunts and uncles. I held them accountable. And certain people shouldn't just get a pass just because they're family either. I don't know where that came from. Where we feel like, oh, you're my mom, you're my dad, you're my uncle, you're my grandmother, whoever. So you get a pass on negative behavior or negative traits because you're your family. Or because I turned out all right. It's really important to have these tough these tough discussions if you can, especially as a as a adult and more particularly as a parent, because if you don't, you're gonna pass a lot of negative things onto your kids without even realizing. And they're going to suffer for the things that you had to suffer through. And you definitely don't want to pass stuff like that down. And now it kind of comes full circle. If that young lady who asked the question, what does a father bring to a child's life other than money, only had a father in her life who did that, when she finds a husband or a boyfriend or she has a child that child's father is going to be expected to do exactly that and only that. And that child's father's success is going to be based on how much finance he can provide to the to the relationship or to his father. So it's a perpetual cycle. It can be really, really scary, really, really negative. And it, it, it stops with us. It stops with us. But that's all I had, y'all. So a little shorter episode this time around. Not too long. Uh, I hope I didn't keep you guys too long. I hope I kept you engaged. And please, please, please follow me on social media to to stay in the loop and to get some exclusive content. Um, I've been getting back into gaming, too. So I've been posting some really bloody and some really gruesome Mortal Kombat videos online. So you all should go and check that out, too. It's, It's pretty dope stuff. Uh, as always, I'll I'll talk to you guys online. I'll see you later online, and I'll keep talking if you'll listen. Take care.